Great. We have all of our presenters here or our, our honored guests, um, favorite people, promoted people. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for being here. And to everybody on this uh, call, um, good evening. Um, I'm Connie Cho. I'm a third year law student at Harvard Law School. Joined as my co-host tonight is my comrade, friend, fellow third year law student, Rio Scharf. Um, we're two students in the HLS Justice Lab course, which is led by Professor Hansen and um, Systemic Justice Program Director Jacob Lipton. They're hosting this series on systemic lawyering in times of crisis and have kindly allowed us to take over for this evening. Um, we're also two student organizers of a now postponed critical race theory conference, so we're really humbled to convene some incredible attorneys uh, who are abolitionists and decarceration advocates today. Um, as we experience what is perhaps most the devastating public health crisis of our time here, uh, here in the United States, um, we've been assembling a network of hundreds of law student volunteers uh, to support our attorneys like the ones on this call. Um, they're working tirelessly to decarcerate jails, prisons, and immigrant detention centers. Um, our work to convene um, law student volunteers was a response to the emergency call to action from the Justice Collaborative about a month ago, um, where Josie Duffy Rice, Andrea James, Ayanna Presley, Patrice Colors, um, uh, Erica Andiola, and others really helped clarify our values and prepare us to act in this terrifying time. We've been working in partnership with the law student-led People's Parity Project to recruit more volunteers. So if you are a law student that has not yet signed up to volunteer and you have the capacity to do so at this time, please do go to peoplesparity.org slash coronavirus to sign up. Now we're hoping that this call can serve as a practical convening. Um, we'd like to give it as a baseline training primarily for law students with ties to Massachusetts, but we will all need to be advocates as individual residents to call on elected officials to decarcerate um, and as we offer our volunteer legal support and as we eventually join the legal profession profession during a pandemic. Uh, that's of course if we get barred or licensed ever. And uh, so let's get started. Um, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, so people should feel free to drop in questions in the chat along the way, but um, we'll also have some time for that at the end. Rio? Hi everyone. I'm just gonna take a moment to introduce our panelists. I just have to say I'm terrifically excited to have uh, these five people with us. They've been some of the people that have been advancing some of the most novel and creative uh, solutions to the problems that COVID-19 has raised in our nation's jails and prisons. Um, and what really inspires me about them is the sort of movement lawyering orientation that many of them have furthered and the way that their rapid response reactions also are furthering long-term visions for how to better treat people in our nation, how to get more people free, um, how to reduce the terrible conditions that we see across the country in our carceral institutions. So um, I will give a brief introduction and then we'll jump into questions. Um, Alec Karakasanis is the founder and executive director of Civil Rights Corps. CRC is especially well known for bringing high profile and highly effective litigation, challenging unjust bail and pretrial detention practices. In this moment, CRC is on the leading edge of creating strategies to get people out of jails and prisons during this crisis. Um, Really grateful to Alec for being here with us, um, and he'll be dropping off uh, about 30 minutes into the presentation. John Matthews is the Senior Legal Counsel at the Justice Collaborative. Uh, there he helps to track the impact of COVID-19 in our nation's jails and prisons and works to provide resources to organizations securing people's release from detention. John is a Harvard Law alum, a former president of BALSA, and a former student of Professor Hansen. Oren Nimney is an attorney at Lawyers for Civil Rights here in Boston. In his legal practice, he focuses on cutting edge constitutional litigation on behalf of people of color and immigrants. He is also the legal editor at Current Affairs and teaches at Suffolk Law. Recently, he filed suit to remove people detained by ICE in Massachusetts in light of COVID-19. David Lewis is the chief of the Integrity Review Bureau at the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. His work in the Integrity Review Bureau focuses on post-conviction case review to create a more accountable DA's office, which is especially important during this crisis. Prior to joining the DA's office, David's private law practice specialized in litigating civil and criminal appeals in state and federal court. 
Katie Naples Mitchell is a fellow at the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice here at Harvard Law School, spearheading the Court Watch MA initiative in partnership with Families for Justice of Healing and the Massachusetts Bail Fund. Katie has been engaged in rapid response work in these last few weeks, including the amicus brief of 14 leading experts in epidemiology, public health, infectious diseases, and healthcare for incarcerated people, filed with the emergency petition to free our people at the SJC. She has been uh, a really incredible partner in setting up the decarceration law student volunteer network uh, from the start. Um, so those are your distinguished panelists. Um, and without any further ado, we'll get started. So to start us off, um, just thinking a little big picture, um, uh, I want to pose the question, how should law students or younger advocates be thinking about the threat that COVID-19 poses to people in jails, prisons, detention centers, and in the public discourse, what's most missing from, what's most missing um, about COVID-19's impact uh, in jails and prisons? Um, maybe John, could you kick us off here? Yeah, sure, Connie. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you guys, Connie and Rio, for organizing this. Uh, Professor Hansen, who was my section leader, uh, my first year in section two at HLS, like you've always been a champion um, for the most vulnerable people and thinking about systemic change. So really appreciate this. Um, I mean, I think the best way to think about this is it's, it's devastating, right? Like, so this moment's made clear what many of us already knew, which is that way too many people um, way too many of our people suffer in cages around the country, um, and many will die unless we fundamentally transform the criminal legal system and our detention systems, right? So we're in rapid response mode. Um, immediately, the idea is if you don't make changes now, like this is going to spread like wild, wildfire in our nation's jails, prisons, and to de de uh, detention centers, right? Um, it's hard. You can't social distance in these places, right? Um, people are in cages. And there's a ton of work to do. So, you know, our messaging has been all about that and thinking about um, county level, um, statewide, like who are these actors, who's in power, um, who has the power to make these decisions and how are we gonna hold all these people accountable? Um, and there's a lot of ways, different ways that that's happening. And I know the other panelists are gonna talk about a lot of that, but you know, those are the base, basic messages we're focusing on is these are the most vulnerable people um, and I, I know initially there was a lot of movement pre-trial, um, but now you're starting to see more movement with prisons and detention centers. So I hope that that trend um, continues. But another thing that is made very clear is, you know, a lot of times we get into our silos, but, you know, I agree with Rashad Robertson. He always says, um, you know, people experience life in total, not in the issue silos we often use. So we've been thinking a lot more now about how this connects to re-entry, housing, um, health and, you know, really trying to connect the dots because some of the questions we'll get is, all right, like when we let people out, like, you know, where are they going? How are they going to have support? Um, and so even though those aren't, that's not necessarily our expertise, we've been trying to be nimble and like really connect with folks and provide communications uh, support to the organizations that are doing that work. Um, and I think what's missing from the public discourse, um, I, there's actually been um, more coverage nationally than I expected. Um, so we're trying to continue to drive that coverage. Um, I think Connie mentioned, so we, the appeal is part of our umbrella organization. So just consistently putting out um, journalism that's not law enforcement driven and that's telling um, stories of the most impacted from the crisis and just like making very clear connections, um, like I said, about like accountability. And, and I think public shaming is very powerful in this moment. And so I think you know, the actors, whether it's a governor or a DA um, or a sheriff, you know, when people start dying from this, like making it clear that they had the power to do something and, and that they didn't. John, could you, um, or maybe Alec, Katie, uh, David, could you, uh, before we sort of get in the weeds on the strategy, could you also just say something about who has power right now, um, what some major targets are? Um, who can act? And then Oren, if you want to jump in with sort of an immigration focus gloss. I'm happy to jump in if you all want as a sort of on, on the ground local organizing work. So 
in my bio, it mentioned we do a lot of partnership with Families for Justice as Healing and the Massachusetts Bail Fund. And just to jump back to the first question, I think in terms of two things that are hugely missing from the conversation and that are super important are that people who are incarcerated are loved by their families and many of them have homes to go home to. And so there's a huge narrative about people who are incarcerated who um, face houselessness when they leave, which is an important subset of the population and we should be talking about housing people in dorms and colleges. But a lot of people who are locked up have loved ones who would welcome them home. And that's a hugely important part of the conversation that's missing. And a second point I'd like to make is that uh, a part of the conversation that I think is easily co-opted and becomes an immediate loss for our movement is that people who commit acts of violence are capable of change and are not violent people. So I just wanted to add those two things as, as pieces that are missing at the, at the outset. Um, in terms of people who have power, uh, we're looking at judges and prosecutors and the DOC and the governor and the parole board and here in Massachusetts, the governor's council. Um, there are so many different criminal punishment system stakeholders who have power and who could make discretionary choices, sheriffs as well, to change things that are entirely within their control and release people from incarceration today where the law would not have to change a single bit. So part of what we've been doing with community partners on the ground is mapping who those folks are, what their power is, um, and the litigation we were involved in was one kind of element of the power mapping, honestly, more, more than anything for, for our role and for the organizing work we're doing that's more broadly, getting access to emails for all of those stakeholders was huge for the movement, um, that now we can have them for longer term decarceration work as well, um, and helping to understand when people made uh, representations to the court that were untruthful, that now we have those kind of prior inconsistent statements, thinking like a lawyer that we can use in future organizing work. So um, everyone has power, turns out, and none of them are interested in using it. And people in power are the first to tell you that, they, that hands are, their hands are tied, right? So organizers know that's not the case and push back. Thanks for your fight, Katie. Um, Warren, do you want to mention something um, in the immigration context before we go on and dump, jump you know, headfirst into these litigation strategies and other strategies? Sure, um, and you know, thank you. Thanks everyone for, for hosting this. this is a good conversation. And uh, you know, it's a really particular moment that you know, what happens in crisis, right, is a lot of power is laid bare and a lot of the, the lies that we're told about things that need to happen, about people that need to be in cages are, are shown to be really false. And the same thing is what we're seeing in, um, the immigration detention uh, setting and shout out to the, the students from PDP and that volunteered as well because some of this information is actually directly a result of research that students did uh, for me. So thank you. <laughs> um, uh, is, but, um, you know, states um, and the federal work hand in hand uh, to uh, lock up people in immigration detention all over the country. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, our states and counties are complicit in that. We have a number of county detention facilities, um, Bristol and Plymouth and Barnstable in particular, where um, local sheriffs have entered into contracts with the federal government, the Department of Homeland Security, in order to lock up um, people in immigration detention. And so who has power in that setting? Obviously the federal government, the Department of Homeland Security and ICE have a bulk of the power, but also because this detention happens as part of a partnership between local government and federal enforcement, uh, sheriffs, superintendents of jails, and the governor also have power. And uh, you know, the, the governor and the sheriffs control these facilities. And so to the extent that you can, they have control over those facilities, they could choose to uh, release people from those facilities. And so far, you know, some people have been being released all over the country, um, both from uh, criminal detention and, and immigration detention. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of revealing how unnecessary uh, the detention was. Thank you, Oren. Um, question for Alec, while we still have you on the line. Um, can you give us just an initial overview of some of the tools that are being used right now to decarcerate in this crisis? And what are some of the legal approaches and some of the arguments you think people should be putting out more widely? Sure, thank you. And it's obviously wonderful to be here, like, like everyone else said. So I think to, to contextualize that question first, I think I need to say one thing about the broader context within which we're finding ourselves in this pandemic. So this pandemic is taking place in an era of unprecedented human caging. Um, so we have 2.3 million human beings in 
3,163 local jails and 1,700 state prisons and immigration detention facilities and, and, and child caging facilities all over the country. And it, it's, it's, it's taking place as a result in the context of a culture that has completely um, become desensitized to the brutality inherent in caging human beings. And so um, I think that the, the, the normalization of human caging that has become a, a everyday feature of these punishment bureaucracies and indeed our culture, our culture more generally um, is potentially vulnerable in this moment. And I think um, all of us as, as attorneys working on behalf of, of, of individuals who are, who are caged and also as, as people who want to be part of a much broader movement that's building power need to be thinking strategically about how our legal work to fit into a, a, a real cultural moment of changing the way we think about human caging. Um, and so uh, in, the, in that context though, there are, and so that, that's a, the context of real opportunity to come up with legal strategies that can plug into that. There's also some very serious um, perils that, that I think await us in that, in that struggle because I think uh, at the same time that it's a moment of, of amazing opportunities, um, anytime there's a crisis like this, the people that have power respond, I think, in, in a couple of, of consistent ways. One is they try to use the crisis to exert more control physically and through surveillance over people's bodies and minds and communities. We're seeing that all over the country with, with, um, the, with drones that are taking um, people's temperatures um, to um, various orders. The Texas governor just issued an order um, that I argued against yesterday in federal court. Um, that suspends the power of state judges to release people without bond. Um, and so uh, the, the, the sort of carceral and, and fascist elements in our society are combining to, I think, use this moment to, to push things even more. To, I, think, I think they're com they see this moment in the same way we see it as a moment of opportunity. They see it as a moment of consolidating their power and control. And then secondly, the thing that we have to be very scare scared about, I think, is in these crisis moments, people that own things in our society try to increase that ownership. They try to increase the um, distribution of, of, the, of, of inequality um, and consolidate their wealth, um, mainly through privatization. I think we're likely to see um, through medical, through risk assessment, through supervision and surveillance technologies, we're likely to see those, um, those investments be increased significantly, um, especially in this time when when the government is giving out hundreds of billions of dollars in, in no interest loans to large corporations and when many small businesses and cooperatives are, are going to be um, going under. And so a lot of the work that people are doing, for example, around the country to set up worker owned co-ops for people that are coming out of jail and prison, um, for people that are coming from heavily policed communities, those worker owned co-ops are struggling right now. Um, and, and a lot of the capital that might have been invested in them by local and, and state governments is now going um, through various mechanisms to large corporations. So in that context, I think it's absolutely imperative that as lawyers, we, tr we, we, we work in a way that fights against those larger um, systemic forces and that builds power. And so specifically, what I've been really interested in is looking at the places where there are already very robust local abolitionist um, campaigns that are not just um, trying to tweak bail policies here or there or tweak sentencing or make small changes to um, the, the um, types of cases that, um, you know, get fines or fees or probation or slightly lower the probation sentences, those reforms to be a little bit less cruel are all fine and good. But what I'm really interested in is people that are organizing around a radical and inspiring message that the entire point of all of these systems, their legacy in white supremacy, their legacy in capitalism needs to be questioned. And so this is a moment when I think a lot of people in the population are now thinking, um, how can it be that human beings are in cages, um, exposed to this deadly virus with no ability to protect themselves? Um, how do we get to this point? How do we get to the point where all of these people are in jail um, for no good reason? Um, we, sh we should have been thinking about all of these problems as public health crises from the very beginning, and now is our, our, our chance. And so we, we have been bringing litigation in, in a few uh, major cities that attempts to, to, to support some of that organizing by highlighting some of the connections between local caging facilities as centers of um, contagion, um, as centers of, of physical violence against human beings, as centers of family separation. Um, a lot of us are, are, are thankful that we can be with our families in this time of uncertainty and, and fear um, and separation um, from the rest of the world, 
but there are many people that have been separated from their families because their families and family members have been taken away and put in a cage and they can't even contact each other because they can't afford the price of a phone call um, because a large corporation controls access to our loved ones and has monetized human contact. So what, what we've been exploring is where are the folks that are doing that organizing? How is this a moment when lawyers can support that organizing through very strategic legal claims that highlight um, some of the narratives that the organizers are, 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 are are weaving about the need to divest from human caging and to invest in things like public health and wellness. Great, thank you for offering the context and also um, the sort of principles that are guiding your all's litigation and, and legal efforts at this time. So following up on the connection between litigation strategies and grassroots organizing, um, love to hear from you or anyone else about how is movement lawyering looking during this crisis as you watch the legal response, in what ways do you think it's reflecting the values of movement lawyering and, and really doing well to establish those connections? And in what ways has the last month exposed the lessons that many lawyers still need to learn about how to do rapid response and, and movement lawyering? I guess I'll take that since I'm heading off in five minutes. Um, I, I think one, one important lesson is you can't just decide to be a movement lawyer one afternoon and just start being a movement lawyer. Um, movement lawyering, which we're not doing very well, and I don't think many people are, are doing it very well yet, right? We always have much more to learn, but one thing is definitely true, and that is it's about building relationships. It's about accountability. It's about developing a sense of who you're accountable to and how they're going to hold you accountable over a longer period of time. And so for, for many people that are just jumping into these cases now, understandably, because you know, there's a lot of pain and suffering happening and, and lawyers have a very particular set of skills. We need emergency habeas petitions and civil rights actions filed in every single one of these places that are detaining human beings and taking them away from their loved ones. Um, so I'm not criticizing people for wanting to get involved. But what I'm saying is that to do this work well, you need to know who in your community is organizing people to build power. Because many of these legal claims are not being brought because they're likely to be successful ultimately in federal court. I have never trusted the federal courts to be the, the, on the vanguard of, of ending human caging in this country. They are just a, a locus that can draw attention for this conversation. Um, and so um, we're not bringing, we may win some of these cases because I think you know, we, we have the law on our side because the law as it's written in this country um, is quite good and, and, um, as, a, as opposed to the law as it's practiced and, and, and and, and enforced against people's bodies. Um, we, we have good legal claims. I'm not saying we're not gonna win, but we're not bringing them to win. And we have to expect we're not gonna win. What we're doing is creating a moment for local organizers to get people free through other mechanisms in a lot of these cases. And so um, in this moment, I think the, the people that I've been seeing around the country that are doing it best are those lawyers who already had relationships with organizers who went to people in the community, people who are directly impacted, people who have loved ones inside, people who are themselves inside, who are organizing, organizers outside that, that represent them and that are accountable to them. And they said, how can we be of service to you in this moment? Here are some of the things that we could offer. Here's one thing I could do. Here's another thing I could do. Here's what some other organizers and lawyers are doing in other cities. We can help you do that. Tell us how we can be of service to you. And, and if you have trust in those relationships, what, one thing I've seen that's very inspiring is some of these lawsuits that we've been a part of happened in a matter of five or six days, interviewing dozens and dozens of people in jails, getting and organizing local nurses and doctors and epidemiologists to come together and statisticians and um, organizing people on the inside to provide their, their testimony, whether it's through video, audio, handwritten declarations, photographs. Um, these can come together enormously quickly if you've already built that, 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 that set of relationships. And so, one lesson here is if, you don't, if you're not in relationship to people who are, who are fighting in your community um, for these radical but, but obvious principles of human dignity and, and, and relationship, you should be so that you can get involved in a much more deep and meaningful way and you can be prepared when moments like this happen to be at your highest and best use. Thank you, Alec. Uh, does anybody else want to speak to sort of their assessment of how movement lawyering is operating in this moment and what lessons are pretty clearly left to be learned? We'll jump in really quickly. I mean, I, I echo a lot of what Alec said. I think movement lawyering is hard and none of us are doing it 
well all of the time. There are some really good examples, but it's always something, you know, it's always a learning process. One of the pitfalls that happens in rapid response moments is lawyers tend to view their skills as kind of a, a really blunt instrument. It's like, oh, you know, a crisis is happening. I'm going to jump in and file, file the litigation. And that's the, that's the thing that I'm supposed to do. And I think, you know, the, the, the caution of women learning is, is to take a step back and sort of deal with how we're going to reframe power, how uh, litigation is actually going to work or not work to support uh, power building and organizing movements, and also how we're going to frame questions. You know, a lot of the litigation, and this isn't a necessarily a critique of it in the sense that a lot of uh, harm reduction work is also necessary, and so getting any single person out is wonderful. Uh, a lot of the litigation is framed around, you know, oh, this one particular person is really, really sick. There's no real problem with the system of caging. There's no real problem with kind of the situation that we find ourselves in. But this individual person is a very sympathetic person. I get the, I, like, I get the instinct for that. And, you know, many of the, many of the clients that I'm currently representing are, are quite ill and need immediate release for that and need to be with their families for that reason. Um, but I think that there's a substantive difference both in legal strategy and in pairing with organizing and building the power of cases that focus on the most uh, tightly formed legal claim versus cases that really try to cut to the root um, of power and say, no, 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 the problem wasn't the medical issues of the specific person in a cage. The problem was the method of, like the fact that caging was going on. And so at least what, what in our suit against Bristol County, what we've tried to do is not not limit the class to detainees that have particular medical conditions or people um, in any sort of situation to just focus on everyone inside and to pair that with organizing that uh, a lot of like excellent folks in Connecticut are doing um, their bail their bail fund out there and a, and a bunch of immigrant advocates in Connecticut and also folks organizing that folks are doing on the inside where they started a work stoppage in tandem with uh, the filing of our litigation. Thank you all so much. So we want to take some time to now think about organizing at the local scale, especially in this area, to give students uh, in this course an idea of um, how lawyers and advocates and impacted communities have been organizing around here. So, um, David, uh, you know, it, you have such an interesting biography um, as sort of a, a longtime civil defense, um, uh, civil criminal um, and defense appellate attorney. Uh, you have a lot of experience doing post-conviction relief, you know, um, from sort of, I guess, the, the outside world, and now you're in government. Um, I think actually it would be really useful um, to take like a timeout moment and it, do you think you could share just some technical expertise on, especially for the 1Ls out there and for the ALs who haven't, you know, um, need a little crimpro refresher? Um, what, what are the major legal mechanisms that are being used right now? And in your role um, at the Suffolk County DA's office, um, what, what position does that now put you in and what role are you playing there? Okay, so basically, um... Like what is emergency habeas, you know, yeah. what are the causes of action? Is it picking up? All right. Um, yeah, no, basically what we're dealing with, especially with uh, uh, the SJC's order on Friday, uh, is that they're requiring, at least the people I normally see that get to me are, if you're usually talking uh, homicide defendant, uh, usually been incarcerated for a number of years, probably several decades, it's an older case. Um, they don't have any new trial motion pending or any of that thing of that sort. Based on the SJC's order from Friday, they're requiring those defendants in order to have a stay motion that's going to get acted on, they're requiring them to have an active motion for new trial, excuse me, motion for new trial, or say something like a 25B2 motion, which is a little bit different um, and may not be completely applicable. It would depend on the facts and circumstances of a particular case. Um, so those motions, I mean, technically, we can look at the motion to stay without doing a deep dive on that new trial motion. It kind of depends on the particular defendant. Um, most of the defendants I'm looking at, like I said, are very elderly. They're probably at Norfolk. Um, 
There are a few that aren't, but for the most part, they're all at Norfolk. Um, I sort of knew about some of the legal claims before that, just because I was familiar with who they were ahead of time. Um, and I'm just working with those defense lawyers to sort of flesh that out as quickly as possible. Um, you know, to the question earlier, you know, just a couple of points that sort of crossed my mind. Uh, I think one thing about this that's driving home to people and isn't maybe covered maybe as well as it should be uh, is the fact that these institutions, it's all permeable. Like I think people have the impression and always did that, you know, sort of someone sent off to Shirley or Walpole or Norfolk or wherever, uh, and they're sort of gone. It's sort of sealed off, like they could be on the moon. And I think what people are seeing now and have to understand is there are people cycling in and out of these institutions every day. They're permeable, they're part of us, they're part of our communities. And if you don't understand that, you totally don't get why it's so dangerous having so many people there in those conditions. Because, you know, once COVID gets into one at some of these places, and it already is, it's going to go through it very quickly and it's not just going to stay there, it's going to come out um, with a lot of the people that work there. And to somebody else's point when you're talking about, um, you know, places to go, and it sort of goes to the community. I see these guys all the time that come in. They have sisters and aunts and wives and people in the community that are willing to take them in and willing to accept them and want them back. And it's not a question of whether the community is going to be safe with these or safe with these people there. It's actually the community would benefit from having some of these people there. So it sort of turns that around too and makes people confront that. Uh, the issue, the underlying sort of issue is, are you going to define everybody by the worst thing they ever did? And so, and I, the last point I'll make is sort of goes to what someone else was talking about, power centers, is I would counsel somebody, like, don't look on them as sort of binary or separate, that you've got this one and that one and this one over here. It's more sort of a concatenating system where this stuff is all linked together. You know, people say that, you know, the DA Rollins all the time, you need to release so-and-so or whatever. But it's like, look, she doesn't do that. The judge does that. You know, certainly we take positions in front of the judges, but, uh, and I take a position in front of the judges, but it's, it's, it's sort of this interlocking system. Sort of, you know, people can talk to me, bring things to my attention. Like Katie, I talk to Katie, you know, fairly frequently. She lets me know and I love it because I, I don't know about these things unless you tell me, right? So I hear about these things. Sometimes I can do something, sometimes I can't, but I always want to hear. And I'm sort of part of that link. So if you can talk to, if one part of that link's willing to listen, then, you know, you start working through it. And the idea is to get as many of those links looking, listening to you as possible. Thank you, David. Um, and actually, Katie, Orin, could you pick up on that in, in um, David's metaphor of linkages um, or in our power map, as you were describing earlier, could you just flesh that map out for us, Katie? Um, and also referring back to um, the SJC decision. Sure. So the, the original petition that was brought, um, originally they sued the chief justice of the trial court. So the way that courts are set up in Massachusetts, there are basically four parts of the trial court for criminal matters. There's the juvenile court, the Boston Municipal Court, which is its own weird little world, the district courts all around the state, and then the superior court, which hears um, indict, indicted uh, cases um, <clears throat> and cases that carry more serious time. So the trial court oversees all of those parts um, and was the original target of the suit. But when it got to the single justice, um, she added a whole bunch of other respondents to the petition. So all of the district attorneys, all of the sheriffs of every county, uh, the parole board, the Department of Corrections, the attorney general, uh, you know, a whole, it was pretty much every criminal punishment stakeholder except the governor uh, directly um, who were involved in the litigation in some shape or form. Uh, and then kind of factions developed um, in, in the next round of responses, right? So seven district attorneys uh, under uh, like Bristol and Worcester and um, Hamden and uh, I, Norfolk and a whole bunch of them filed one filing. All of the sheriffs in the state filed one filing together um, in unanimity, which is interesting because some of them 
position themselves as if they are doing something humane, and yet there they all were with Thomas Hodgson all together, right? Uh, which I think in some ways the litigation was helpful as a power mapping exercise because it exposes that these kind of feigned fault lines where people say, oh, but we disagree, oh, but we're providing care and treatment to people inside of our facilities become the, the kind of mirage of that fades away when they all take a stance together because they want to preserve their power over the people in their custody. Um, <clears throat> so those factions developed and, and different DAs uh, in Berkshire County, Middlesex County, Suffolk County, um, and the Northwestern District, which is uh, Hampshire and Franklin counties, um, they all filed kind of their own separate uh, <coughs> positions saying that they have been working with defense attorneys, which was true in individual cases to review um, certain people held on bail, which is something that those offices were doing, but in the opinion of advocates, way too slowly um, and with, without a lot of coordination, in part because of real data sharing problems that happen in, in the Commonwealth that I will not deny that uh, I know the Suffolk DA's office has been begging the trial court for data for about a year and a half at this point um, <laughs> to say, um, it would be useful if you could give us real-time case information so that we could know who's in the jail. And there is no information sharing that happens. And that same problem appeared in Berkshire County. Andrea Harrington made a filing that said, uh, it included emails where she had asked the, the sheriff for information about who's in the jail and had been totally rebuffed, no response. So um, it, the other thing about the litigation is it lays bare these kind of pressure points, right? The lack of data is a huge problem for organizers as well as for these stakeholders, right? Because we would like to also know without having to wait a week to know who's in the jail uh, and also to have some kind of information about, okay, so we know there are 471 people in Nashville Street Jail as of March 30th, and the jail's at 105% capacity, um, but are they there on probation violation detainers, or are they there on bail, or who's there on dangerousness? We don't know that information. In fact, pretty much nobody knows that information unless somebody demands they go look it up, um, <clears throat> and, and those kinds of fault lines are, are important for us understanding. Now, there was a question in the comments that I'm going to jump in for a second to go back to um, about the role of the governor in all of this, and whether there has been active clemency campaigns either in Massachusetts or, or elsewhere. And the answer is there are hugely active clemency campaigns um, all around the country right now uh, in New York State, in California, uh, here in Massachusetts, there is one. Uh, I think the, the governor of Kentucky announced today something like a thousand people are going to be released from prison early. Um, so the governors have a role to play. And in fact, the clemency power in most states is pretty much unbridled, right? The governors make clemency guidelines. Sometimes there's an abortive pardons um, or an advisory board of pardons as there is here in Massachusetts. Our parole board sits as the advisory board of pardons. People submit um, a petition for pardon or commutation that the board then uh, votes on and then it goes to the governor's council and the governor to make a final decision. Um, but that process was totally tanked basically in Massachusetts um, in a, almost a decade ago when there was a, <coughs> a man who was released on parole and um, committed a murder after that point. And so there haven't really been any commutations and the parole board kind of became even more dysfunctional than usual after that point, after the Sinelli case. Um, so Governor Baker has not issued a single commutation and has tremendous power to do it. In fact, at her confirmation hearing in January 2020, or 2019, excuse me, as the chair of the parole board, which also sits at the advisory board of pardons, Florian Maroney said that there were 240 to 250 petitions just sitting that the board hadn't acted on. So there are hundreds of people that are waiting for a petition uh, for commutation or pardon, and the governor is totally sitting on his hands. Families for Justice as Healing and the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls have been leading an incredible clemency initiative. They sent the governor I don't know, 50 postcards a week last summer, and they have continued to push for clemency and, and prepare applications for a lot of women who are elderly and aging and survivors of trauma who are inside MCI Framingham, as Andrea James would say, under the prison. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of women who need to come home, and there are a lot of people who need to come home, including folks who have had positive votes of the Board of Pardons. Somebody like Arnie King, who pretty much everyone universally agrees should be out of prison, has tremendously transformed his life, has had any number of luminaries write in every paper of record um, that he is deserving of clemency. And yet here Governor Baker is sitting on his hands not doing a damn thing. Katie, what can people do right now 
um, or after this call <laughs> to um, help out or join in? What can what can they do? And um, I'll, I'll ask Lauren, um, David, uh, John, uh, for you guys to also chime in. What do you think that law students and just people on this call can do? Well, I'm going to make one quick plug and then stop taking up so much space. But um, <laughs> one thing that's happening right now is Families for Justice as Healing and the Building Up People Not Prisons Coalition has been organizing a weekly week of action. This is week three of the week of action. Um, and the targets change slightly each week. And uh, there's always a call script, numbers to call, Twitter handles, sample tweets, email script, emails to target for various stakeholders, including all the folks we've been talking about. So if you wanna plug in and get involved, you can go to tinyurl.com slash MA week of action. That's my plug. Um, yeah, I could take this one. Connie, first of all, I mean, just the research that you guys are already doing is like super helpful. Um, any law students that wanna get involved, um, it's just every day we get requests for help with research, um, we're in rapid response mode. So we often don't have the capacity. And so the stuff that you guys are taking on is really important, but also on a daily basis, there's organizers around the country that have, like Katie was saying, all different campaigns that are happening either month long or day long or for the week. And they're often looking for just amplification. Like, hey, can you tweet this out? Um, can you raise awareness? We're trying to put pressure on the local DA. And so because there's so many systems across the country that are just really bad. And um, like I said, public shaming, I think is really important in this moment. So um, amplifying through your social media, uh, we've, we've had a lot of both local and national demand letters that have been going around. around. So um, that's usually, I mean, in some cases in LA County, for example, we had immediate response um, and thousands of people um, let out of the jails. Uh, and that was both a decision by the sheriff, but also the DA made some decisions. Um, LAPD, we sent them a letter and they, you know, they didn't, they actually had a pretty positive response, but didn't commit to any policy changes, but they're like, oh, but, you know, can we set up a call to talk more about it? And so I think just the supporting local movements, there's just so many actors and so much to be done. Um, you know, I think students can definitely plug in in a lot, a lot of different ways. Um, another thing, letter to the editor, um, op-eds you know we've been like helping with com uh, communication support for op-eds you know there's just a ton of different we're we we don't do a lot of traditional litigation work and so we're always thinking about like connecting with other advocates locally and figuring out what support they need for their movements that are already happening but also potentially pay, pay, uh, playing a translating role to the extent that there's any legal issues that they don't quite understand or um, any actors that they don't quite understand the power of helping to figure out um, if we can get them information about how those actors function and how we could put pressure on them. So love the idea of power mapping Katie and just figuring out how to just keep coming after these folks. And, and like I said, there's so much work and so many different actors that there's a ton of ways to plug in. Thanks. Yeah, just on the immigration front, I mean, uh, I think a bunch of folks are doing great work and, and I would sort of echo the groups that, that Katie mentioned. Um, and the, the the people's parody link that you just put in um, is a great way for students get, to get connected. I also think that specifically for law students, sometimes there's a tendency to silo yourself as I'm a law student and so I can do legal research and that's the only thing that I can do. But you're wrong. You could do things as just a normal community member. And so there's a bunch of mutual aid organizations that have been built up around uh, the coronavirus that are existing, uh, you know, um, here in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge and around. That you can get plugged into and start building power and um, making connections with community members that are in your community. Um, you can engage in these camp the in specific campaigns um, against you know targeting DAs or governors or sheriffs uh, to both actually win those campaigns um, and then also to continue to build power so sort of that so that they will continue to be organizing long after uh, we deal with this pandemic. And then just to to name three immigrants rights groups that are doing good work right now that we've been working with really closely and that we work with not just on issues of detention, but also on issues of um, workers' rights um, and healthcare and a bunch of different issues that sort of intersect with immigration status. Um, folks can, can, can check out uh, Central Presente, which is an immigrants' rights organization in East Boston. Uh, Chelsea Collaborative, uh, which is a great immigrants' rights organization in Chelsea. Um, and the Brazilian Worker Center, which is a worker center in Alston. 
Thanks so much. Um, I'm wondering if you guys, um, I know a lot of you guys spent time on email together. I'm wondering if you have questions for each other um, and also um, attendees of the webinar. Um, this is a good time to put your questions into the chat if you haven't already. I mean, the one comment I'll make uh, to goes to what uh, Katie was talking about a little bit ago. Uh, the sort of lack of use of clemency power, uh, you know, there's, uh, it hasn't really been used in decades. I mean, legitimately used. And personally, to me, I think you see, you know, uh, sort of rise of the conviction integrity unit movement and other other movements, um, sort of to compensate for that. Because I think that the lack of that creates a distortion in how this is supposed to work. I mean, it's supposed to work, right? It's supposed to be there for the cases where we know they're nonviolent. They've shown they're nonviolent. They can come back into the community, right? And that just hasn't existed. It just, it, it, after Willie Horton, basically, that just went away. Um, so, I mean, that's a huge problem um, that the absence of that is foisting the sort of uh, ability to do anything away from the governor on to basically DAs to bring these cases to the courts. And then you work this other process when there is this executive branch system that's there, but is just sort of at this point is kind of vestigial, like it's not really been used in a really long time or, you know, and it could be, and it should be, I, I think. Um, I would just add, I mean, the research that you Rio have been doing for me is like so helpful. Like I seriously, I can't even, I can't even tell you. I mean, stuff like that, just having access to that ability um, is incredibly helpful to me. I just want to add more on clemency that if folks are looking to do a little bit more background on what, what the issue is in Massachusetts and elsewhere, um, a research fellow named Ben Notterman at the Center for the Administration of Criminal Law at NYU Law um, has put together a couple of really good briefings about the governor's clemency powers. And there's one on Massachusetts that um, aptly is named uh, like in the shadow of Willie Horton. Um, and I wanna make a comment whenever anybody invokes Horton to note that um, he never went by Willie, that that itself is a racist epithet that comes from um, kind of a, a brutalized image uh, of a black man. And, and so we have to be thinking about issues of race and power always when we're talking about criminal law, but um, especially in invoking that anecdote too. Thanks so much, Katie. John, could I ask a question about um, some of the collaborations that you started seeing um, and how people are sharing resources um, and what the common sort of legal strategies that are being in and political strategies that are being used right now? Yeah, sure. So I guess a bit of background. We had already as an organization started reaching out to a bunch of folks and trying to figure out how we could get less siloed. You know, we were already doing county level work, but just trying to build like a national network I should say a national network of like local folks, so people that are already working um, in their counties and cities and really connect folks across disciplines. So like law, um, traditional like organizers, we've in, in this age also brought in um, public health officials and tried to really make a public health argument. So um, on Slack, we have a justice hub and we've tried to bring in um, leaders from around the country and just get more conversations um, going about like what's been helpful um, litigation wise. Um, today in LA County, um, there's a discussion, you know, ACLU, um, actually not supposed to disclose that. So ACLU is going to do something soon <laughs> in California. Um, but simultaneously, there are organizers that are organizing a protest. Um, since we can't do traditional, um, you know, stand outside the courtroom protest, it was like a, a car procession where it's like people have um, signs in their cars and they're um, and they're like showing different messages about decarceration. And then once you have that, then that's a reportable event. So then you have reporters that are reaching out, reporters will reach out um, for comment. And then people, will, that starts a discussion about like what's happening in jails and prisons. And so amplifying all these things over and over again, while there's simultaneously litigation happening, um, just to force people to do, you know, so it's, it's, it's an all hands on deck approach that's trying to incorporate everyone. And, and recently, um, there's a guy who has done incredible work and he reached out like just about like incorporating more impacted folks into everything, right? Like not just like using folks stories and trying to exploit the moment, you know, just really having like leadership on a bunch of different levels. And it's, that's to me, what's given me hope is I think before there wasn't, at least as far as my organization is concerned, there wasn't as much or enough collaboration across 
uh, disciplines. And so to me, the hope is that this continues in that. Um, there was a, another example of a national sign on letter to the governor's association where it's like, I, it was like 160 organizations across the country were signing on um, to put pressure on, on the governor's, like exactly what we we're talking about, the clemency issue. And so, um, you know, this isn't, it's not a strictly legal approach. A lot of it is understanding the power at all these different levels and how they interact and then advising movements that are already happening. Um, so when I think about movement lawyering, that's to me like part of what like needs to happen is just like, like Alec was saying, like trying to be more present, understanding what's already been happening, what people are already working on. Um, and it's also really helpful to not jump in and piss a lot of people off because the quick way to do that is to come in without context and start litigating or doing whatever lawyers do. And then just, you know, people that have been working on it. We, and, and like I said, this is not something that we're uh, immune from. So just trying to be aware and connect the dots as much as possible. Thank you, John. Um, so we have just two more questions and then we'll wrap things up and let people get back to their work or hopefully their lives. Um, our first question is uh, from somebody with the Massachusetts Coalition for the Homeless asking about, you know, what's being done right now to support those who are homeless. Um, I, for these panelists, I'd, I'd ask, especially for those who are homeless and maybe in pre-trial detention, um, what can be done to support the effort to convince judges um, that people can be safely released and that people have somewhere to go? I'll just put one plug in because it was amazing to me. So one of the things that's been happening in our litigation um, is that one of the requirements on release and so far as of right now, only 18 people have been released, um, is that uh, the judge is wanting people to have, uh, you know, a sort of stable place that they can go back to and quarantine themselves uh, for 14 days along with a bunch of other conditions. And uh, obviously that presents a huge problem for uh, folks that are currently houseless. And so um, one of the, the great pieces of pairing um, one of the great things that comes out of pairing litigation and organizing so well is that you have community groups um, and in this particular context, faith organizations that are doing such amazing work finding housing for people. And so what we've been able to do, and this sort of goes to the judge question as well, is work with organizers who are very willing to open up their home um, and, and welcome someone in who's just been released from uh, immigration detention. And they've been writing, um, you know, affidavits and declarations saying, look, here's my house. I'm willing to accept this person to my home. That shouldn't be the, re the reason for not for release. Um, and we have 48 people um, across Connecticut and Massachusetts that have volunteered up their houses um, and their homes. And it was kind of amazing to me because there was, there was a moment of panic where I was like, oh no, how are we going to get people out? Um, and uh, everyone really stepped up. And I think that sort of goes to Alex's point from before of, why it's important to do things in a long-term space because that wasn't you can't generate that amount of housing out of thin air um, that has to be from a community that's already worked together for uh for years and years and has that kind of trust and has that kind of coordination um so that's one of the things and showing that to the judge was um convincing and acceptable and so that has facilitated people getting out i do agree that you know i don't have a bunch of good answers because there is just a huge problem um here right you know the governor to speak to the power of governors could have uh essentially commandeered hotels in massachusetts under his under his powers and allowed people to stay there um who don't currently have homes for the pendency of this crisis but he, you know he didn't and so um you know that that's on his hands but also we should should continue to pressure him to do so yeah just to piggyback off of that um you know what, we, I actually got an email from somebody from a, somebody at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless uh, yesterday asking precisely this question, saying, we're a provider, we wanna be involved in helping get folks out of detention because we know they're not safe in there, but we also don't wanna bring folks to congregate shelter because we know they're not safe in there. You know, something like 200 people in Boston's um, long-term houseless community now have been diagnosed with COVID, which is like a third roughly of, of the shelter community, although there are lots of folks who live unsheltered as well. And uh, one thing that's been happening um, that we know from working kind of our organizing coalition with material aid and advocacy program, which is um, a really uh, kind of low budget, but extremely effective mutual aid organization um, that's 
headquartered at the Friends House here in Cambridge. Um, they do a lot of work giving people material aid for so for people who are living in tents or other encampments and it's a, a huge problem that started when the crisis began maybe you know four weeks ago in massachusetts was that police were going to encampments and breaking them up so people who were living in in places that were in some ways safer for them in terms of a health analysis than congregate shelter where people are kind of living and, and breathing right on top of each other that if people were in their own tents in some ways that's safer and that's a choice that a person could make and that's situation um, that they were being policed because of it right and this has been a, a huge problem um, elsewhere as well so we've been working with organizers and and it would be great to get you involved too we should connect offline um, to try and think through what would a pressure campaign look like to get universities to offer housing for this Suffolk and Tufts have already offered up dorms for first-line responders um, but none of the other universities have offered up their housing for any kind of, of option and um, you are all Harvard students, or many of you are, who are on this call. So if you want to be involved in coordinating a campaign to try and get Harvard to open its doors to folks coming out of jails and detention, that would be awesome. That's something y'all could do. <laughs> thank you for that call to action, Katie. Um, and thank you for that answer, Oren. We got another question from somebody on the call, and I just want to bridge it with our closing question so we can move towards a conclusion. Um, the question was about uh, increasing or at least um, maintaining some level of transparency around our correctional facilities. As these correctional facilities start to shut down to family visits, especially uh, transparency decreases, it's harder and harder to know what's going on in there. The DOC is more and more controlling about what information gets out um, and whether it meets their narratives. So what tactics are working to sustain transparency around correctional facilities? Um, and then the broader question that um, I want to pose as well is, as we think about organizing and litigation in this moment, not only to respond to the crisis, but also to further broader, longer term goals that we have for how to change or get rid of these correctional institutions, how do we make sure that the changes that we're advancing are sticky, that they last, that they are, um, they're not gone once the crisis is over? So either of those questions um, to any of our panelists. I'm happy to speak to the first question about what's going on at SUSE to the best of my knowledge and, and all the DOC facilities. So Friday was when the SJC decision came down. Saturday morning, DOC announced that all state facilities, all 16 correctional institutions that are run by DOC are on 23 and a half hour a day lockdowns. And in fact, in some of them, it's more harsh than that. Um, we're hearing from some folks who are inside that they're getting 15 minutes out of their cell or their dormitory every day to power, use the phone, use the kiosk, um, do all of their things that have to be done outside um, and then get back in and be in lockdown again, which basically they're trading one health public health crisis for another and in fact doing nothing to really prevent the vector of disease, which is the correctional officers who are coming in and out of the prison and are more likely to be the ones who are spreading the virus, right? Um, and instead they're, they're locking people in, which is a form of solitary confinement for some folks. Um, and and uh, the situation is really dire. Not only is that true, but additionally, there was another incident of brutality at Sousa over the weekend as well, separate and apart from the lockdown that was initiated Saturday morning. So you're absolutely right to ask what kind of accountability can happen in a climate where our access to information is so dramatically decreased. But I'll also say that, again, building on the point that organizing is already happening and building on existing networks of organizing, um, people already have, I mean, people inside are already organizing, right? There are existing organizing formations inside Norfolk with the African American Coalition Committee. Um, the Families for Justice as Healing has long-term, long-standing relationships with so many women inside Framingham. And in fact, Prisoners Legal Services operates at pretty much every correctional institution and, and talks to folks. And so we're getting a lot of inside-outside information sharing as much as possible in the little bits of info we get through core links when people are outside of their cells to be able to send emails in the 20 minutes that they have. So maintaining open channels of communication is hugely important. Um, and, and the answer is to keep organizing. Any of our other panelists want to speak to how to make sure that the advances we fight for right now are long lasting? I mean, I think, and this echoes maybe on something that Alex said and something that John said as well, you know, uh, there's, there's a risk here that in the crisis, you kind of make an advancement and then it's like, oh, that was just during crisis time. We don't, we don't need to actually deal with that. And I think one of the ways to deal with that, and this has sort of been the theme is, 
is building power for long-term organizations. But another way to deal with that is also to start to use this moment to create a shift in culture. Um, and that that helps to carry things forward. I mean, I think the reason that movement lawyering is not just sort of the better way to do things, but also the more effective way to do things is because we actually do see, you know, with historical civil rights victories, um, often those victories are short-lived if they're victories at all. And one of the reasons why is because sort of legal victories don't actually translate to changes for folks on the ground. Um, and folks on the ground can't really, act, don't have access to, you know, whatever the, the particular legal change has been because that's not the way that the law is playing out in courtrooms or, you know, uh, is playing out when police beat people up on the street. Um, and so I, I think that those are, those are kind of the main keys is to, to use both legal strategies, but also non-legal strategies, you know, like media, um, you know, like the appeal, I think does a very good job of this um, and continuing to reframe and um, build a, an alternative narrative that people can say, oh, okay, this is the, you know, reason things are happening. This is how I can understand uh, this type of particular problem. And yeah, and just, you know, hearing more um, from folks that are inside, you know, I wanted to write that uh, folks in Wyatt Detention Center in Rhode Island are also on hunger strike right now. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think just to add, I think we'll have a lot of opportunities to see what worked and in, in, in which places where people were actually just decarcerating um, at more than minimal levels. And I think what we'll find is that the sky didn't fall, like nothing happened, people were good, they were home with their families, and we're fine. So we should like not go back to the levels that we once incarcerated people. We should continue to decrease those levels. Um, I also think um, with all these budgets coming out, both federally and all the in the states, I think we have an opportunity to really shift from to a care approach, right? To look at look at public health and investing in other institutions that really um, will prevent people from encounters with the system. And I mean, relatedly, like I said, thinking about um, police as well, right? Like we should have like part of the reason why police should be interacting with people is from a public health reason, right? Like they don't want to get infected. They don't want to infect other people, but it's, it should also be a lesson in like, we don't need more police. Like we like pe police should stop interacting with people at this level and they should just stay um, out of it and let communities handle um, issues that arise. So I think there, there's a lot of an opportunity structurally to change this and, and think about like where our dollars are going. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you all. I really wish that we could give a round of applause to our panelists, um, but it's not technologically possible at this time. Um, I want to thank you all for the work that you have been doing. Um, I want to thank you for being here with us tonight. Please keep sending projects our way. Um, for those students who have the capacity right now, uh, it's been really cathartic for a lot of people to be contributing to these incredible frontline projects that you all are all advancing. So um, please keep yeah. sending them our way and letting us know how people can get involved. I just want to summarize a few of the um, suggestions people have made about how students and others can get involved right now. Um, and then we'll let the panelists go and I will turn it over to um, Jacob to let us know about next steps for class. Um, so the asks include joining Pipeline Parity Project's effort by going to peoplesparity.org slash coronavirus, joining the weekly Weeks of Action with Families for Justice's Healing, and the Building Up People Not Prisons campaign. You can go to tinyurl.com slash MA Week of Action. Check out the justicecollaborative.com to find campaigns and policy efforts that you can contribute to and help amplify right now. There are tons of mutual aid efforts in Cambridge, Somerville, or Boston that are not hard to plug into. You can go to Mutual Aid Hub, you can Google that. Um, immigrant organizations and worker organizations need your support right now. Check out Centro Presente, Chelsea Collaborative, and the Brazilian Workers Center. Um, you know, John Matthews said people experience life in total and I, I really that that resonated with me. So if it's um, if it's not decarceration work that is speaking to you right now, just find a way to plug in if and when you have the capacity to do so. Um, it's really needed right now and it can be um, really, really um, can really help you get through this crisis in, uh, in a way as well. So thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I want to let you all go right now. Great. And have a Thank really you. good evening and take care. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks all for this.
All right. Well, that is it for Connie and I. Um, we'll now turn it over to Jacob to let us know about next steps. Thanks for everybody who's been participating. Um, and thank you to John and Jacob for making this happen and uh, coordinating so much of that.